Well, it was my honor to welcome Mitch Prosser back to the pulpit at Community Bible Church. Um, Mitch is the director of policy and church engagement with Palmetto Family, located in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, Mitch is a strong voice of biblical values in our state, in our region, and, and really extends to our nation as well. He was ordained in the ministry in 2008, and in 2007, he married uh, his wife, Christina, and has three sons, and they're back in the back section over here. Just raise your hand, Christina, and the boys. There, they're over there. Yeah, you can welcome them. Yes. Anyway, Mitch, I'd love for you to come and open us up in prayer, and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Won't you bow with me in prayer this morning? Father God, we love you and are so grateful for the opportunity to call you just that, our Father. I pray today that as we open your word, as we look into the perfect mirror that is your word, we will be challenged and convicted and motivated to change, to look more like your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for the families that are represented in this room this morning, for those that are listening online or in a different location in the satellite campus this morning. I pray that those families will stay strong, that it is men and women of courage, conviction, and faith, you would make us bold to stand strongly in the midst of the opposition that we face in this age, and yet humbly, joyfully, as warriors of the light in the darkness that we are surrounded by. Lord, may you be honored and glorified during this time as we look at your word, and may we be moved, challenged to be different and more like you when this time is through. I pray this in the matchless name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen and amen. I want to take you to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 4. And while you're turning there, uh, I'm a really simple guy. I just, you know, what you see is what you get. And I, I tell people everywhere I speak, there's three things you need to know about me. If you've ever heard me speak here at Community Bible Church before, just nod and smile and everything will be okay. Three things you need to know about me. The first thing, I love Jesus. I mean, simply put, plainly spoken, I love Jesus. He's the reason I breathe. He's the reason that I speak. He's the reason that I hope. He's the reason that I'm here with you in Beaufort Community Bible this morning. I love Jesus with everything that's inside of me. I love my wife, my college sweetheart, number two. Well, not wife number two. That sounded really weird. (laughs) She's my my only and current wife. We've been married 17 years, Uh, my college sweetheart and I. We have three little boys, Ethan, Connor, and Graham. They are in the back. Uh, They are 10, 12, or 12, 10, and almost 7. I'm reminded, and he reminded me a little while ago, it is his birthday month. Uh, So he'll be turning 7 in just a couple of weeks. Please pray for my wife. Um, our dog is a boy. There, yeah, there's a lot going on there, a lot of, a lot of bumps, bruises, and yeah. boo-boos, and band-aids, because they're boys. I just, yeah, and, and, yeah. And the third thing you need to know about me very simply is that I love America, and I love the great state of South Carolina. I believe South Carolina is one of, if not the greatest states in the United States to live and work and raise a family. You live in a wonderful area here in Beaufort, South Carolina, and I believe you live, I was talking to Pastor Vince just a little while ago in between services, I believe you have one of the best churches in the best state, in the best country on the face of the planet here at Community Bible Church. You are blessed. You are blessed. I want to take you to a a, a place Several years ago, and I, I want to start, if you will, laying the ground for, groundwork for where we're going to go in 2 Timothy chapters 3 and a little bit of 4 this morning and focusing in on what it means to build strong families in the midst of the culture that we are surrounded in. Growing strong families and homes 
that will be godly representations of what it looks like to live according to the truth of God's Word. As I told a, the group just a while ago, if there's one thing that you leave with today, it's this. God's Word is truth. And in a world that is begging the question, what is the truth, where we don't know down from up what is truth, you can rest assured that God's word is the truth, and all truth is God's truth. If I were to take you back just a few years ago, I'd take you back to 1882, the turn of the 20th century, the 19th century, a guy by the name of Frederick Nietzsche was around. If you don't know who Nietzsche was, um, as my friend John Stone Street, the Colson Center for Biblical Worldview says, he wasn't a great guy. He wasn't someone that you'd just be like, oh, I, I got to get me some more of, of Nietzsche. I just, he's, a, he's, a, uh, he's a European, he's German he is a German philosopher, which means his head is probably filled with a lot of emptiness, and he is a self-proclaimed, bold atheist. No doubt about it. He is going to be one of those guys that mocks Christians at every turn. And in 1882, Frederick Nietzsche wrote one of his most famous works known as The Parable of the Madman. The whole point of this fictional work was to mock those who believed in the existence of God and the very existence of God itself. I want to read you a couple of excerpts from the parable of the madman that I think will be revelatory of where we were at the turn of the 20th century the begin, or the end of the 19th century. And I think that you'll notice a pattern that has led to where we are today in the modern 21st century. In the parable of the madman, it's the story of a, of a crazed individual who continually searches for this figment of the imagination, as Nietzsche would believe, God. Listen to what he says uh, in, in the beginning of this parable. He says, have you not heard that the man, madman lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran into the marketplace, and cried incessantly, I am looking for God. I am looking for God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing together there in the marketplace, he excited considerable laughter. Those in the marketplace began to ask the madman questions like, where is your God? Or, or has, have you lost him? Has he sailed away on a, a voyage? Has he, has he hidden from us? Is he simply hiding? Is he afraid of us? Maybe he's immigrated. He's wandered off into a far off land. They laughed and shouted and mocked the madman as he asked the question, where is God? The madman sprang into the midst of this group who was mocking and laughing at him, and he said these words. He said, God is dead, God remains dead, and get this, church, we have killed him. Now, this was a word from Nietzsche in the proclamation that the Enlightenment had occurred and no longer was a civilized society in need of a God-like figure, certainly not the God of the Bible. The madman continues on after saying that God is dead, God remains dead, and that we have killed him. He says, how shall we comfort ourselves as those who have killed God, the murderer of all murders? What was the holiest and mighty of all the world has yet now bled and died on our knife. What water is there for us to cleanse ourselves? He then says this in response to the replacement, if you will, if the society at large in the 19th century, 1882, had replaced God with themselves, listen to what he says right after this. He says, is not the greatness of this deed, us killing God, so great for us, must we ourselves not become God simply to appear worthy of it? 
Now, this was written in 1882. It's fascinating that he mentions the blood and the, all of those things that, that killing God would do because 1882 was simply 18 years removed from what is known as the bloodiest century on the face of the planet ever in the 1900s. Uh, for crying out loud, we had two of these things called world wars. And for the first time on the, as, in the history of, of man, modern mankind, the entire world was at war with one another. Certainly, Europe, where Nietzsche was from, Germany, was at the center point of those wars, and more people around the world bled and died at brutal communist dictators, national, nationalists like Hitler and Stalin, and the world was on fire. It's fascinating that these were some of the words that were uttered before all of that took place. As if the culture didn't need God and now was going to suffer the consequences of replacing God with themselves. I think that stands in stark contrast to where we were founded as a nation, as a Christian nation. And for those who would argue against the notion that America was founded as a Christian nation, I take you back to some of what our framers said. Now, as you've heard me speak here before, I could take you ad nauseum through many of our framers and founders and those men and women who formed and shaped our country for what it is and what it was, and they no doubt paid reverence to the God of the Bible if they weren't themselves Christian. They understood the sovereign nature of the Almighty God of the Bible as we know it. I take you to a conversation that James McHenry, the namesake of Fort McHenry in Baltimore, Maryland, he overheard a lady named Miss Powell speaking to the sage, if you will, the wisest of the men at the first Constitutional Convention, when they were at an impasse and when they could no longer get along, it was Benjamin Franklin who urged them to take a break and to coalesce around the idea of prayer because he knew that prayer was needed not just for agreement but for resolution in the forming of this monumental document. Miss Powell, this lady standing outside of the hall there, where the Constitutional Convention was meeting, somewhat antagonistically looked at Benjamin Franklin, this wise, gray-haired man. He didn't have much hair. He's probably a pretty good guy. Um, she looked at him as he left the hall and asked, Sir, what form of government is it that you have given us? And James McHenry, if not for his, his journals, we would have never known that Benjamin Franklin said this. He said, it is a republic if you can keep it. Now, what was Franklin referring to? That's a good question. He was referring to the idea that people needed to be self-governing. Os Guinness created what is known as the golden triangle of freedom. It is a triangle on the bottom of that triangle that self-proclaims freedom. But freedom needs virtue to exist. And faith needs virtue to exist. In other words, freedom, virtue, and faith. But you know what freedom needs? You know what faith needs? Freedom. And so it's this self-perpetuating upward triangle, the golden triangle of freedom that Os Guinness tells us, if we are going to have freedom, we must be a people of virtue. And if we are going to be a, per a virtuous people, we must rely on faith. Thomas Jefferson no doubt agreed with him when he said, the government which governs best governs least. And everyone loves that part of the statement. However, they forget the second part of that quotation when Thomas Jefferson says that the government which governs least governs best because the people can govern themselves. They are a self-governing people. His arch rival, his nemesis, if you will, said this. John, Qu uh, John Adams, when he was speaking to the militia of Quincy, Massachusetts in uh, October of 17. 87. He said, I'm sorry, 1789. He said these words. He said, our constitution was meant, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people, and it is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. 
Do these sound like the words of Nietzsche nearly 100 years later? Certainly not. Our nation was founded as a Christian nation on biblical principles, and the men, the, and, the, the men and women who framed and founded our country understood that our governing documents were no good if the people that they were governing couldn't govern themselves. But how were they to govern themselves? Once again, good question. I'm glad you asked. They were to govern themselves with the truth of God's word. And yet we find ourselves today in a place where it seems as if the people in America and around the world have erred, have strayed, have wandered away from this founding. So what are we to do? What happens when we are no longer a moral and religious people? That's what I'm here to tell you this morning. There's no doubt that we are living in difficult times. In fact, let me show you just a couple of things that would lead me to the conclusion that we are, in fact, living in difficult times, tough times. Does anybody remember the art of the opening ceremonies of the Summer Olympic Games? Oh, it's just art, you uncultured swine. No finer gaslighting have I ever seen than the social media backlash in the days after the, the opening ceremony. I didn't watch it. I'm just not an opening ceremonies kind of guy. I'm, I'm like a, show me wrestling, show me track, show me, the swimming is cool. I, I don't, anybody that can swim like a shark through a pool is pretty cool. But the art, and if you don't understand it, you're just uncultured. Well, count me in the group that's just real uncultured, Okay. No, it was a direct mockery of Christianity. But if you take it that way, you're just mistaken. No. It was clear. It was evident. The world is mocking Christianity. Political unrest, uh, as he said, I, I, I work with a group of people at Pamela Family Council. I dare say anything political here, but I will simply say this. If you don't believe there's political unrest, I've got to... I, we all see it, right? It's everywhere. Whether in the last four years, the last four years have been really fun. This thing, came, this, came, this thing came through the world called COVID. Anybody ever heard of it? I think we've all just about forgotten about it, you know. After that, my goodness, there's rioting in the streets. I mean, June of 2020, my wife and I, the world is shut down. And we were like, what are we going to do for, you know, we always kind of do an anniversary getaway. But the world is shut down. And I'm looking at, like, flights and stuff, like, where we could go. And I chose the free city of Nashville, Tennessee. I was like, this will be great. We'll go to Nashville. And we're sitting on our couch on a Saturday night. She doesn't, it's kind of, I'm kind of a hopeless romantic. I, don't tell anyone. Uh, and she doesn't know where we're going. I said, just pack a bag. It's going to be great. We're sitting there on Saturday night. I'm preparing to preach on Sunday. We're going to fly out Monday morning. And Saturday night, someone texts me and says, Nashville is burning. And I was like, really? And I turned on, you know, one of the cable news networks. By the way, just don't do that. It's, it's really bad for your health. And no kidding, the courthouse was on fire. I called the motel that we were staying in, which was right across the uh, street from the state capitol there in, in Nashville. And she's like, oh, it's not too bad here. You know, we got to Nashville. Man, it was, the Broadway was boarded up. I mean, the city, the, the courthouse was burnt like, a shell of itself. There were riot police. We watched from our motel room. Um, you know, we had to have masks on in our motel room. Uh, sorry, <laughs> bad. Uh, we watched as riot police surrounded the Capitol every night. I was like, honey, let's go talk to them. So we stood between the protesters and the, the riot police. It was fun. Uh, ask her about it later. It, it was great. Uh, we all remember this, right? Did you know that just a short time ago, politically, if you disagreed with someone, you could say you're wrong and you could say I'm wrong and we could just shake hands at the end and, and like mutually disagree. We could agree to disagree. You can't do that now. Mm -mm. There's no joy in that. Some of you will see what I did there in just a second. I, 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 I'll, I'll get really close to the edge for just a second. We had a political candidate for president 
Someone tried to assassinate a presidential candidate just a few months ago, and, and now it's like, it, that never even happened. Political unrest. Constant redefinition of vital words like gender and sex and man and woman. I, I was joking with the guy earlier, he nearly went in the women's restroom. But before he got to the women's restroom, he self-corrected and said, man, I must not be awake yet this morning. He realized that was a mistake. He didn't boldly go where no man has ever gone before. And yet we're told today, if you disagree with a man in a woman's restroom or a man playing women's sports, you are the self-righteous bigot. You're the weirdo. No. The terms are constantly being redefined. The false, the false tolerance of equal truth claims, my truth. No, there is no truth but God's truth truth the word of god and so any subjectivity of the truth is simply a lie reframed in the moral relativity and equivalence that is the postmodern age no if it isn't god's truth it is a lie and so if your truth doesn't line up with god's truth it is no truth at all not only that, we, we go to Christian parents and the family continually under assault. My friend from California, uh, by the way, it, you know, I, I love it when people come to South Carolina, you know, the Southeast. Don't bring your California to our Carolina. It's just that easy. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was talking to him a while back, and he said, Mitch, you know, one of the things we're noticing, by the way, college football is back, amen and amen. I'm a Tigers fan. We won't talk about it. He said, there's a couple teams from California about to join the ACC. You do the math there, Atlantic Coast Conference. But they're, and he said, here in California, that thankfully the governor vetoed it, but they were staring down the barrel of a law that said if a mom didn't like what a dad said because he was bigoted and said that Johnny was, he didn't agree that Johnny could be Susie or Susie could be Johnny, then that mother could take her children away from the family, or vice versa, the husband could take the children away from the wife, and they could go to California and be safe from that kind of hateful bigotry called truth. And he said, you know what's going to happen is they're going to sell ads on the ACC network and other ad space and they're going to pipe that into these states like Texas and South Carolina and North Carolina during football games and make people feel safe in California. Uh, no. No. Tough times. But I'll tell you this. I, I, I want to be very clear this morning. Tough times are nothing new. Hard times have been around for some time. Paul, the guy that's writing this to a young man named Timothy, his spiritual son, is in the middle of tough times. I skipped too far ahead because technology's wonderful. I, I, I'll take you back, if we can go back to that previous slide, I'll take you to a couple things that are happening in the middle of tough times. We're getting really far ahead now, that's good. Uh, there we go, perfect. The Romans are conquering the world with their war machine. And they're not a great culture in and of themselves. But at the very same time, the Greek culture is polluting the world around them through their perverted culture. Christians are being hunted down and martyred for their faith. Our Savior Jesus has been hung on a cross and crucified. Timothy, the one who is, is being written to here in this, some of the last words of Paul is preaching in the city of Ephesus. It's like San Francisco. Worse so, and I won't go into graphic detail because I know we have young ears in here, but it is a vile and perverted culture filled with lustful action. See the temple at Diana for details. It's awful. And Timothy is being charged to preach in that culture. Tough times were happening back then. Paul, the, t the spiritual father of Timothy, he's about to be executed, beheaded in Rome for his faith. The words that we're about to read, written to Timothy by Paul, are some of Paul's last words ever recorded. And so Paul and Timothy and the Christians of the very first century are no stranger to difficult times. A guy named Michael Hoff, a couple years ago, back in the 90s. Anybody remember the 90s? Way back then, the good old days. 
Michael Hoff wrote a book called, uh, he wrote a book called Those Who Remain. In the book, he gives this continuum. He says that strong men create good times. And I think we've all experienced good times in the past. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create bad times. But here's where I find the encouragement, okay? In the continuum, bad times have the opportunity to create strong men and women. We've all seen good times. The stock market's up and the prices are down. You can, you know, everything's great. It seems like we're in the good old days. And I've, I've often asked, when were the good old days? You know, because I think there's just been this, this tempestuous past. And we take our eye off the ball. We stop watching the wall like Nehemiah charged the men and women of God to do. And if we're not careful, the good times create weak men and the weak men create bad times. And here we find ourselves wondering what in the world is going on. My friends, let me encourage you this morning to give you boldness and courage to say that we have the opportunity in this moment in time that we were created for and placed here by God by no mistake or accident. We have the opportunity to create strong families. Families who will stand on the word of God. Stand, families who will stand with courage, boldness, conviction, and faith and say, we will serve the Lord. No question about it. No matter what the culture brings our way, whether they call us bigots, whether they call us hateful, whether they call us knuckle-dragging troglodytes. That's a Marine. See details later. I knew I, I, I was, I, you knew I was going to pick on the Marines again. By the way, I, and I said I was going to do this for the Marine. I just talked to him a minute ago. You know they say the Marines are a department of the Navy, right? The, yeah, the men's department. Uh, for all of you sailors, I'm sorry. You can come beat me up later. Probably not. Uh, that's the Air Force. Anyway, uh, we have, <laughs> sorry, wow, that went off the rails fast. We have the opportunity to create strong homes, godly families, and how we cultivate them. I want to take you to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read a few extended passages of Scripture, exegete, exposit, and then I think leave with an application that is clear for us, not because of my preaching, but because of the teaching and preaching that's here for us through this genius and God follower named Paul. I'll take you to the first nine verses. But realize this, Paul tells Timothy, that in the last days, difficult times will come. And by the way, the last days have been for quite some time because as this was written, the people believed that they were still living in the last days. Depending on your eschatology, we're in the last days. For men will be lovers of self. Listen to this list and tell me this isn't 2024, let alone sometime around 70 AD. For men will be lovers of self, Lovers of money, boastful, arrogant revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness. These people call themselves Christians or believers. They call themselves Faithful, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres, those snake handlers that opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus and Jambres' folly was also. It was Otto von Bismarck, the leader uh, of the Prussian Empire, who said that only fools will learn from, and only a fool will learn from his own mistakes. The wise man learns from the mistakes of others. I believe verses 1 through 9 are telling us that we are to pursue wisdom. 
to pursue wisdom. And look at the failure of the faithless. The faithless will ultimately fail. I don't know about you, but I, I, everywhere I turn, there seems to be a scam artist everywhere. I'll guarantee you somebody this afternoon is either going to get a call on their cell phone or an email in their inbox from somebody about their car's extended warranty, right? You're going you're gonna to be in line for the buffet later on today, and somebody's going to say, hey, I can sell you an extended warranty for your car. Don't do it, okay? If you sell extended warranties, God bless you. There is a prince of Nigeria somewhere trying to get you to invest or he wants to give you the keys to the kingdom. Don't do it, okay? I'll tell you a story about a lady named Brenda. Her name has been changed to protect the innocent. A, a young lady that I, I pastored some years ago, I, I learned parts of the story before her death, but after she passed away, her children told me the rest. In the process, her husband passed away, and so she was lonely and, 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 and you know, just wanted companionship. She got an email one day from a, a gentleman, a good-looking gentleman from across the pond. He was actually in South Africa at the time, but he was from Charlotte, North Carolina. And he needed help getting back to the United States. He's, I mean, you know, his, his, he lost his wallet or, you know, can't, can't remember his password or whatever. And if you'll only send me a thousand dollars or two, then I can get back to the States. I can get back to America. I own a home in Charlotte, he says, and he can, he can, he can be with her and they can be fast friends. They can, they can love, they can, they can get married. Everything will be fine. Just help me get back home. Her children look into this. He, they're actually, these people are good. There actually was a home in Charlotte. It was abandoned, not for sale. There wasn't a sign out front. It, it looked like somebody was overseas and, and wasn't living there. They're good at what they do. Slowly but surely, she began to give money. What happens is he finally flies home. Get this. Some of you are like, I can't believe this. He finally flies home. He's leaving the airport. And as he leaves the airport, he gets hit by a car. And he's in the hospital. They actually sent a picture of him in the hospital. This guy that doesn't exist. But if you'll only give me a little bit of money for the hospital bill, these three of her children, Brenda's children, are telling me this. Post her passing away, all of their inheritance is gone. What little bit they had is gone because of con men. They're everywhere. Well, that sounds like troubled times, right? We can use wisdom and pursue wisdom knowing that there are spiritual con men out there. They will do everything in their power to distract you from the truth of God's word. They're spiritual snake oil salesmen. If you'll just follow this advice, if you'll just simply plant this seed money, if you'll simply, I don't know about you, but when it comes to walking and living for Jesus, there ain't no simply about it. For only three easy payments, no, no. We can pursue wisdom knowing that these faithless people will ultimately fail. And the question that so many people are asking is now, Will they fail now? Maybe not temporally. Maybe not even in this life. But let me tell you this. The failure of the faithless will be evident for all of eternity. Even if they claim to follow Jesus. By the way, if they claim to follow Jesus, just measure them according to the standard of righteousness in God's word. Proverbs 21 and verse 11 tells us, When the scoffer is punished, the naive becomes wise. But when the wise is instructed, he receives knowledge. Wisdom comes in when we see what's going on, the failure of other people, and we learn from it. We say, oh, I don't want to do that. That, 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 that would be foolish for me to do. To follow the foolish would itself be foolish. See, what the world is offering is a type of fair food. The South Carolina State Fair is coming up soon. Can't wait. I'm about to lose several of you because it's almost lunchtime. When I start talking about things like Fisk fries and corn dogs and those happy little donuts that they powder the sugar and they sell them in a bucket and loaded um, chicken wings and, and a donut burger and things like, yeah, all right, some of you are gone. It was nice seeing you today. 
Every kid, and as soon as I say this, I, my, my three sons' eyes are going to light up. Every kid loves cotton candy. Yeah, he's pumping his fist back there. What the spiritual snake oil salesman, the faithless are offering is cotton candy. You say, what do you mean? It looks good. I bet you it even tastes pretty good. But it is empty. They literally put some granules of sugar in this machine that spins it up and it makes it look bigger than it actually is. And at the end of the day, it's nasty. It hardens as solid as a rock if you leave it in the car too long. It's like, what happened? This used to look good and now it's awful. And that is what the spiritual snake oil salesman is selling. I'll I'll tell it to you this way. Let me ask you, uh, and uh, any firstborn in the room? I am the firstborn in my family in the birth order. Yeah, that's right. Firstborn, unite. If you are the second through whatever, as long as you're not the baby, you're the middle child. Any middle children in the room? All right, good. Yeah, let's go. Any, Any babies in the room? You're the baby. Yeah, all right. Pastor Ben over there. Baby? All right. Good deal. If you're the baby of the family, you grew up with your best friends, that's good, good for you, congratulations. Your parents, that is, because they they treat you, you know, like whatever. If you're one of the middle children, you had the opportunity of learning from the mistakes of us, the older children. If you're the oldest kid, kid, you're your parents' crash test dummy. They get all of the mistakes out of the way on you before they ever do them on the others. That's why my head looks like this. All that to say this, if the younger children make the mistakes that the older children made, they're not learning. It's not wisdom. We can become wise understanding all of the mistakes that have made, been made before us and around us. It's a wake-up call. But let me tell you this, this is not the license for Christians to walk around, I am perfect and proud of it. You all make the mistakes. No. I am forgiven and humbled by it. Christ in his grace forgave me. And I have the opportunity to tell a different story and to live a different way. To live a different way. Wisdom tells me that I am to walk differently. But how so? Take a look at verses 10 through 13. Now you follow my teaching. Paul loves lists. You're going to get one in every passage here. Now you follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance. Persecution? Wait a second, Paul. This was happy up to this point. Sufferings? Such has happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecution I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Listen to verse 12. Indeed, all... All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This sounds like the prosperity gospel now, doesn't it? No. Paul's saying, wake up, Timothy. If you're going to follow Jesus, you will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Not only should we pursue wisdom, Let me be very clear, church, we should model devotion. Paul is modeling devotion for Timothy. Will the path of faithfulness always be easy? Will it be easy in difficult times? The answer is absolutely no, it will not. But it is worth it when we are faithful to Jesus. When we walk as he wants us to walk, when we talk as he wants us to talk, when we Follow him, it will be worth it. Listen to the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil, your labor, your faithfulness is not in vain. It is not empty in the Lord. It is worth it to follow Jesus. See, the world around us is asking some questions. What is truth? The world is begging the answer, what is truth? Uh, Who am I? What's my purpose? What's the point of me even being here? So we, as the people, the men and women of God, as families, as the church, we must model faithfulness and devotion. See, Timothy is reminded of the path that's been walked before him by his spiritual father, Paul. Parents, you, you too must model 
devotion to your children and your grandchildren. We've got to do it. Who else will they learn from? By the way, it's our responsibility, parents. Student, model devotion. Model faithfulness in your school. Yes, your elementary school, your middle school, your high school, your college, your university. Professional, when everybody else is cutting corners, when everybody else is going about it the wrong way, when they're doing whatever they do, you stay faithful to God's word. Model devotion. Christian, in the land of the lost, walk the way that generations before have walked. They've modeled it for us. They've handed it down to us. It is now our turn to hand our faith down to the next generation. You see, Christianity is one generation from ceasing to exist. And it is our duty as men and women in this generation to model that devotion to the next generation or else they may not know about it. I'll say a name. I'm reminded of the faith and courage of a young lady. Her name's Cassie Bernal. Some of you, that name is lost on you. You were either too young or maybe not even born yet, but I think she's a name that uh, we all ought to remember. And on April the 20th of 1999, um, she said yes. She said yes to believing in Jesus, and it cost her her life. You, you might remember the story. It was the first of the school shootings of our generation in Columbine High School in Columbine, Colorado. Two young men walked into a school fully armed to the teeth. They went around the school. They actually went to a specific place at a specific time targeting a few young ladies like Cassie, Cassie included. And they faced her down and they said, do you believe in God? And she had a moment to deny, to reject, to say, no, of course I don't, or to say yes. And she chose to model devotion and say yes. And just a few seconds later, she was with the Jesus that she so boldly proclaimed to follow. Friends, that's how you model devotion. And by the way, it's pretty hard to do that in death. It's really difficult, too, to do it in life. You see, the word encouragement literally means to give courage to others. And that's what we must do. As we model devotion, we are to give courage to others, encouraging them. Not, it's not just a nice pat on the back. Oh, you're doing a good job. No, it is telling people you have courage as I have courage, and we will have courage together as we model devotion in this culture. We show them. We watch them. We let them do it. Parents, that's how we do it. We show them what to do, we model it, we watch them, we observe it, and then we let them do it. We've got to model devotion. All of us, by the way, are modeling, whether you know it or not. You are teaching people, whether you know it or not. Parent, they're watching. Your kids, your grandkids are watching. Student, you're a role model, whether you know it, whether you like it or not. Citizen of heaven, the world around you is watching. They're watching. They may be waiting for you to mess up. So what are we to do? We're to live well in the good times. We're to model devotion in the bad times and even in the ugly times. See, devotion is good, but misguided devotion can be a very, very, very bad thing. So our faithfulness must be rooted in something strong, something secure, something steadfast. What is that? Take a look at verses 14 through 17. Verses 14 through 17 tell us what our devotion should be anchored in. You, however, speaking Timothy, to Timothy, but to us also, you, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have heard them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. In some of the most famous verses in all the Bible that give us a strong root of our bibliology, all scripture, all of the Bible is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God, those of us who call ourselves Christians, may be adequate, equipped to every good work. Not only are we to pursue wisdom, and model devotion 
You see, we are called to live a biblical world view, to live out the Bible. Continue in these things, Paul tells Timothy. That means that we are to walk in them, to continue in them, to live in them. He is charging his young son, Timothy, in the faith to live according to God's word. And so when the culture around us swirls with all of the questions that they hurl our weather the way our way, whether they are honest questions or dishonest questions, we are to live according to God's righteousness in his word. And here are some of those questions. I find these some of the most famous questions asked today. In some way, shape, or form, you've heard these questions. Here's number one. What is truth? What is truth? Well, that's a good question. Do you know the Bible is good for teaching and doctrine? Here's another one. What's the big deal with what I'm doing? Okay, the Bible tells me I'm sinning or I am a sinner. What's the big deal? That's a good question. The Bible's good for reproof. How am I supposed to live? Okay, here's truth. I am a sinner. I have sinned. What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live the right way? See, the Bible's good for correction. Some of you have probably asked this or you've heard it asked. How do I live out who God wants me to be or who he's called me to be? See, the Bible is good for training in righteousness. God's word is good. It is profitable. It is strong to answer all the questions that the world and life itself can hurl its way. God's word is perfect and complete. It is reliable. There is no other truth but God's truth in the word of God. And so we can rest assured in that. It is perfect for us. It is God-breathed. It is given to us by God. So the Bible is our source of truth in a world filled with lies and error. It is our source of clarity and focus in a world that offers uncertainty and ambiguity. It is our peace and security that God's way is the only way and the right way. It is our absolute standard of righteousness. Our compass, if you will, for right living in a world filled with moral relativism. I point you to the psalmist in Psalm 119. He says this in verses 9 through 11. He says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word is your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Verses 105 and 6. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I will confirm it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. You know, one of the things that I'm hearing so much today as I, I, as I work through the world and, and legislation and laws and, and I hear all of this and you've probably heard it too. We're focused on the whole of a person. The whole of a human being, the whole family, keeping in mind the entirety, the whole of an individual, a a family, a child. So how then do we make our families and our children ourselves, how do we make ourselves and our families complete by living out a biblical worldview? By walking according to God's standard, we believe that the word of God is our bedrock, our foundation, our guidestone, the gold standard of all of life. We believe that. But let me be clear, I am not talking about moralism. Moralism, the idea that you lick your finger and see how the wind is blowing. No, no. We are talking about following God's word, whether it's popular or not, whether it's comfortable or not. You know, one of the, it's so hard in practice, but you know, it is so easy to lay your head on your pillow at night knowing that you don't have to worry about what anybody else thinks except for God. And when we walk in his righteousness, when we live out a biblical worldview, we can rest assured that we are pleasing him. You see, God's people and his messengers, we are called to a mission, to fulfill a mission, a ministry, if you will. And, and Paul tells Timothy in Chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, what that mission is. I want you to take a look at it. He says this in the first five verses. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. You say, I'm not a preacher. Yes, you are. 
You are a living, breathing preacher. Not just by what you do, but by what you say. Preach the word. Be ready in season, whether it's a good season or a bad season, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, you, me, Timothy, be sober in all things, endure hardship, Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Accomplish the mission. Accomplish the mission. We are called by God to preach and proclaim his word in our lives, in the way we walk. Yes, of course, but also in our words. You see, it is simply not enough for us to show the world by our lifestyle, but We must also proclaim it with our words. We cannot shrink or shy away from the truth of God's word. You see, the world around us needs his word. And let me be very, very clear. The world doesn't need more of me. The world does not need another Mitch Prosser, right? My wife agrees. No. The world needs more Jesus and less of me. I love John 3.30. He must increase, I must decrease. More of him, less of me. And, and, and I like you. I love you. I, I, you're, you're a pretty awesome group of people. More of him, less of you. And so as we walk and we, as we talk, we are to accomplish the mission by fulfilling the ministry of preaching the word. See, the world doesn't need another you can be good enough message because we all fall short. Trust your heart. This Disney gospel... <laughs> The heart is desperately wicked. No. That's tickling the ears. We need the reality of God's righteousness. We need the truth of God's word. We, in our inability to fulfill the truth of God's word, we all fall short. We all fall short of God's standard. I don't know about you, but that's jarring. And I might be speaking to someone in this room this morning that says, you know, Mitch, that's exactly what I need to hear. There's never been a time when I've trusted in the grace and the goodness of God, when I've I've taken my life and placed it in his, his hand and said, you do what only you can do. I'm tired of falling short. I'm tired of failing. I'm tired of blowing it. And I've tried so hard, and I've gotten nowhere. Good news, friend. The hope of the glorious gospel of Jesus is enough to save you. It is enough not just to leave you where you are in the muck and the mire of your sin. It will pull you from where you are, and it will make you more like him. I love what the Bible says in 1 John. It says he is faithful and just to cleanse us, to rescue us from our righteousness. He is not just faithful enough to forgive us, but he cleans us up. And you have the opportunity not only to be forgiven, but to be brought inside and given a new change of clothes after you've made mud pies out in the backyard for a really long time. And you're nasty, you're dirty. And he says, come on in. I've got a shower waiting on you. I've got a fresh change of clothes. You are my child. You see, the world needs a message that Jesus is our only hope. Let me be clear. Jesus is our only hope. And without him, we are hopeless. Jesus says this in John chapter 14. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no man, no woman comes to the Father but by me. You want to get to heaven? You want to live for all of eternity in the presence of a Father that loves you? Jesus. Reject Jesus, reject hope. If you want hope, Jesus is your only hope. See, our mission as Christians, as followers of Jesus, 
is to proclaim the message of the gospel, the way, the truth, and the life. Not us, but him. The good news of the gospel. I'm reminded of a story that I heard years ago. I've actually seen the video clip. I, I, I love, um, I just love good sleight of hand. It, it, it's so cool to me how someone can move their hands and fake people out in massive crowds. And some of the best on the planet are two guys named Penn and Teller. Anybody ever heard of them? They have a constant show in Vegas, you know, what happens in Vegas, whatever. Penn Gillette was approached by a, a gentleman one evening after one of their performances in Vegas. And this young business professional, as, as Penn describes him, walked up and simply handed Penn Gillette a Gideon New Testament and said, I hope you'll read this. I, it changed my life. I think it could change yours. By the way, in case you're wondering, they're not really polite people at times. Penn Gillette, I, I, I'd love to meet him. Penn, I'd love to meet you. Um, Penn is a self-avowed atheist, pretty militant atheist. God reminds me back of Nietzsche. There is no God. We've killed him. It, it rings true. And Penn Jillette said these words, and they've, ha I, I, they've haunted my mind ever since I heard them. He said, if you believe there is a heaven and a hell, and we do, and you think it's not worth telling somebody about it, how much hatred do you have to have in your heart not to proselytize, to share? To believe that everlasting life is possible and not to tell people? This man, the guy that handed him the Bible, he cared enough about me to proselytize, to share. And so friends, it is our duty to accomplish the mission, to share the gospel, to preach the word. I'm reminded of Nehemiah in Nehemiah chapter three. You know the story. Nehemiah is tasked, he's given the opportunity and the obligation of going back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was in a shambles. And Nehemiah, the cupbearer for, for Xerxes, is tasked, because of what he knows, he cannot sit idly by, and so he goes back to Jerusalem. And he leads the people to build back, I was about to say another word, I'm not gonna do that, <laughs> to build up the walls of Jerusalem again. He, accompanied with Ezra, are working diligently, and they come up with this great idea. In Nehemiah chapter 3, we see how the people coalesced, how they joined as a team to rebuild the wall. And get this, I love that in the latter verses of Nehemiah chapter 3, you'll find that so-and-so built the walls right in front of their very own house. And so-and-so built the walls right in front of their house. Friends, you may not be able to build the walls that are in a shambles in Washington, D.C. You may not be able to build up the walls in Columbia or in the uttermost regions of the earth, and that's why you have missionaries, by the way. But you can build the walls right here at home in front of your very house in Beaufort, South Carolina. And I believe you are placed here in this place at this time for a specific reason. In the world as it is in a mess, bad times make strong men. And we have the opportunity to live strongly. I take you to a modern day Nehemiah. I, you know me, I can't shy away from US history. I take you to George Washington and the fateful crossing of the Delaware. On Christmas Eve, George Washington led a group of men in a ragtag group of men. Many of them didn't even have shoes. They didn't even know if the boats would cross the Delaware from Philly to Trenton. And they surprised the Hessians on Christmas Day for a couple different reasons, but they surprised the Hessians on Christmas Day. And many people believe that the Battle of Trenton was the turning point, the tipping point, if you will, of the war for our nation's independence, the, the war that was going to lead Benjamin Franklin and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson to say those things that they did. But George Washington knew that he needed to inspire his men, and so he handed out pamphlets to all of his officers and encouraged his officers to read this pamphlet to the soldiers, the troops that would cross the Delaware 
not knowing whether they'd even survive the icy river, let alone the Hessians the next morning. The pamphlet was known as the American Crisis, written by one of George's friends named Thomas Paine. And Thomas Paine wrote this pamphlet to encourage those who were struggling in the middle of this tension between King George and the idea of freedom as they understood it. He writes these words, These are the times that try men's souls. The summer, the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. And I love the beginning of the very last paragraph of this pamphlet, this long treatise. Thomas Paine tells those men as they were about to cross the Delaware, as read by those officers, prescribed by George Washington. He says, I thank God that I fear not. I see no real cause for fear. I know our situation well and can see the way out of it. Friends, now is not the time for fear. Now is not the time for us to cower in our churches and, and say, we can't do that. that. No. Now is the time for bold leadership. Now is the time to build strong families, godly families. How do we do that? Well, I don't know if it's formulaic or not, but I believe that Paul is telling us to pursue wisdom, to model devotion, to live out our faith in a biblical worldview, and to accomplish the mission of living and proclaiming God's word as the truth in a world that's wondering what in the world the truth is. His name is Jesus. Father, I pray right now for each individual in this room. I know there's a lot of people just, they're, they're struggling. They don't know up from down. They don't know right from left. They don't know good from evil. And they're wondering, where do we turn? There's probably some in this room. First of all, God, I pray for the person who's lost. They wouldn't necessarily consider themselves lost, but they don't know you as their personal Savior. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them right here in this moment, that they would understand that they are a sinner and they need a Savior, and that today is the day. They're not in this place. They're not in this church by accident. You put them here to draw them to yourself, to help them to know that they are loved Help them to know that they are cared for. Help them to know that they can walk with you. Lord, I pray that when this invitation is given in just a moment, that they would show the boldness to step forward and come down to pastor events and, and, and ask what it means to have a relationship with you. God, for the Christians in this room who are struggling, we, our families are in a mess, we, we turn to the world and the world is, is on fire, and the, it's crazy. It's tough. God, I pray that we wouldn't fear, that we wouldn't shrink back, that we would charge boldly, not of our own power, not in our own name, but in the power and the name of the Almighty, you, God, and your Son, our Savior, Jesus, because that's what the world needs. So for those Christians in this room today who need to recommit our lives and our families' lives to rebuilding, to restrengthening, to growing godly families and building strong homes. May today be the day that we repurpose, we refocus, and we commit our lives and our families' lives to you. I pray now for your people in this place, in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, we've come to our time of invitation this morning, and I'd like to appeal to you in three, three areas. Um, first, Maybe you're like what Mitch was just describing. You're, you have questions about Christianity or you, you've recently put your faith in Christ and you want to learn and know what it means to walk closely with Him. And you've made that decision in recent days. I'd love for you to come. And secondly, if you're a Christian or you've been visiting and you're, you're trying to decide on a church home and you want to partner with us to reach our community with the gospel and the world, we'd love for you to join with us at CBC as well. And then finally, if you've been a believer and you haven't been baptized yet, and you wanna come and make that profession of faith and you wanna be baptized post-conversion, 
we'd love for you to come join with us as well. So Matt, please lead us during let's this stand time. Together. Would you please stand and let's sing.